So special. Why don't we stand up? I'm glad I'm not the only crazy one around here. And I was starting to feel sorry for these poor guys back in the band. I was like, are you starting to feel a little weird at this conference? And they're just kind of shrinking back. Um, before we start, and I'm about to teach you just a little wake-up song real quick, but um, I want to honor my mom, Cindy. She's right here on the second row in the red shirt. And, um, just want to honor her. I love her very much, and she's my special guest this week and helping me out, so make sure you say hi to her and love on her. She put up with me for a long time, so and still is. Can I tell that story from this morning real quick? what happened in the hotel room, since we're on funny stuff. I'm brushing my teeth this morning and realize mine's the blue one. <laughs> she had the green one. So I put that back and I scoped and scoped and scoped. So I'm trying to get it out of my mouth and I brush them again. Then I realize that was her scope bottle. <laughs> So she orders another toothbrush from the front desk and they finally come and so then she went down to get a bagel and she's out of scope and gets a new toothbrush and realized she got an onion bagel on mistake. <laughs> and doesn't have any scope left. So anyway, but she did brush her teeth and she's fine. She's got gum, so don't worry. <laughs> Anyway, so she said, I guess that's just what happen when, happens when you stay with people. And I said, no, that's what happens when you stay with me, because that kind of stuff always happens to me. Well, we're going to do what I call the bumpkin song, just to wake you guys up, because I'm white and I know it, and I don't know how this song came about, except somebody said something about the river coming and finding them, and I was like, oh, I'm going to write a song. Just a silly little song, but you know, you can actually worship to it if you get into it. But um, I'm going to teach you the chorus really quick so you'll know what to do and I won't feel stupid. Um, when I say it makes me want to laugh, you're going to go, ha ha. Okay, let's practice. And it makes me want to laugh. <laughs> Turn to somebody and say, you almost got it. Now, on It Makes Me Want to Shout, you're going to give a big woo-hoo. But it's not a woo, it's just a woo-hoo, okay? There's two. Don't forget. It's a little pet peeve. So there's ha-ha, woo-hoo, and la-la-la-la. Ready? Ha-ha, woo-hoo, la-la-la-la. All right, so it goes something like this. And it makes me want to laugh. And it makes me want to shout, woo-hoo, good. And it makes me want to sing, la, 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 la. Good, all right, let's start it now. Get some room and get free this morning. We're gonna celebrate the river of God. Let's just have a little bit of fun and praise the Lord for a little while.
touched me. Hallelujah. And then this big old thing called the river of God just came and something happened. I didn't know what, but I'm still seeing the result. And if anyone ever wants to speak against that, they can speak on because I'm a different person. So it doesn't matter to me because I know what God's done in my life. I know what God's done in this church. I know what he's done throughout the nations. And nobody can tell me any differently because I know that I would never have been touched that way if God hadn't done something to rescue me, something drastic. But you know, even one touch from the Lord can do something drastic. He doesn't have to do something drastic in his measure for it to be drastic to us because we're this big and he's this big and he can just do that and we're changed forever. He can do the same thing to the devil, and he's history forever. God's powerful. Let's praise him because he's powerful this morning. God, you are great. You are great. You're in control, Lord. Shepherd, I have no need. You lead me by the peaceful streams and you refresh my life. You hold my hand, you hold my hand, and you guide my steps. I could walk through the valley of death, and I won't be afraid. Cause you are God, cause you. You are 
there's even an inch in your heart that he doesn't have control of, just get it to him. Take it all, Lord. Take all of our hearts this morning. Don't take it, Lord. We give it to you. We give it to you. We leave too much up to God sometimes. Worship is up to us. So just take a moment. Worship. Just worship. Give him your heart. He's not going to steal it from you. We give you our hearts, Lord. We give you our lives, Lord. We give you everything. We give you everything.
God is our refuge and ever, ever present help in times of trouble. Can we just say that to him this morning? You are my refuge and ever present help in times of trouble. We will not fear. Though mountains give way and nations are in uproar, though kingdoms fall, though everything gets turned around, God, you're doing the turning also in our lives. Lord, take our eyes off of what the enemy's doing and focus us on your beautiful son, Jesus. We run to you. If you've been afraid, if you've had hurts in your lives lately, if you came to this conference not quite unabandoned or not quite totally abandoned to Jesus, if you've had some walls up that you still can't quite enter into the full refuge of the Lord, if you've got some trust issues, whatever it may be, women, give it to the Lord this morning. Run into his refuge. We're safe in his shadow only. If we step out of it, we're open game for the enemy. We've got to be covered. Hide us. Hide us, Lord. Hide us in your shadow. We run into your perfect peace. The enemy wants us distracted, I'm telling you. The word says he'll keep us in perfect peace whose minds are stayed on him. If the devil can get us off track and not thinking about the Lord and not focused on Jesus, we're not going to have peace, ladies. Focus on him. Just take a couple minutes right now and just focus. Don't let anything distract you. Lay it down. Lay it down, God. Reveal the beauty of Christ in this room right now. God, if there's walls up, you can't get in. We just knock those down right now through worship. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. We want you, God. You are my refuge. My refuge.
sing over you this one because no one else can touch his heart like you do he loves you and he could search for all eternity long and find that there is none like you he only made one of you and you're special Just let the anointing of his presence just saturate your being. I woke up this morning with one scripture. It's relevant for numbers of you. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Oh, receive it. The Lord is saying, do not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, and your season is just about here, you shall reap if you faint not. We receive that word. Oh, we shake all weariness off, all sloth off. Shake it. Your head like the mane of a lion, huh? Shake it off. Oh, what an awesome God. Well, we want to call you back tonight at 6.30 rather than 7 for a business meeting. My father's house shall be called a house of prayer. Hallelujah! It is the father's business as we yield to intercession and praise and prayer and we just sensed, as I sat there, I focused on two things from early Sunday morning when we were here. And, and we're just going to expect the Lord to lead us. But I heard the Lord say, don't waste all the woman power in here. I have business to tend to. Amen? And so prepare your heart today. We are going to focus in on the leaders of our country tonight. We're going to make specific intercession 
for the leaders of our country. And we're going to pray with our understanding and we're going to pray with our spirit. And so I encourage you to just even see something of what's happening. Our president is on his way to China. He's been negotiating South Korea. We have uh, lots of things that are going on since he declared the evil axis of Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. A lot of stuff is going on, and we can't simply enjoy ourselves here without being available to the Father for his business across the earth. Amen? Yes. So we're going to focus in on that, and then we're going to focus in on prayer for the peace of Israel, the whole Mideast. So we invite you back tonight at 6.30 for the Father's Business Meeting. Amen, amen, amen. And now, ladies, you may be seated as our dear Dr. Iverna Tompkins, Mother Iverna, comes. See me right after the service. <clears throat> Since this is my last uh, message, I will be here to hear the others, but I wanted to take this moment to thank you. So many of you have, have stopped us, uh, we the speakers and those in charge, and said thank you to us. Let me say thank you to you. It is almost impossible to give something to someone unless they're a recipient of it and you have been wonderful and and we applaud you we really do thank you for your openness you came open we haven't had to pry you open and and push it in you came on ready and uh, I thank you for that you you notice uh, the speaker sometimes when we come in and and we're talking back there and kind of giggling a little and you probably wonder you know we get a big kick out of the color thing because we never know what anyone's going to wear and then if several of us match we say now there's the anointing <laughs> if you will uh, yeah dotty was out of sync today but she uh, either that or she was special i couldn't figure it out but if you will think back from the time you arrived until this morning, inclusive of our worship service, you will find a red thread through this conference. Regardless of where the, the messages have been gleaned, whatever speaker has spoken, the method of speaking, there has been one message. You have not had a whole lot of different unrelated messages. I want you to learn to do that because when God speaks, he is saying one thing. He uses a variety of speakers and, and, and messages and so on, but what he's saying is, get ready, get up, get set. I'm about to say go. And I'm going to take you back to Judges this morning, to 4 and 5 there, and, and we're going to see some things that perhaps bring a little closure to what I began yesterday. I, I guess I need to do a little uh, checking on you to see if you were really listening. What was the message that I brought yesterday to Deborah? Ah, you're very good. Wake up. And the first point was wake from. What was she to waken from? I'm listening. Captivity, I'm hearing that. Enemy control, getting used to the way things are. See, if, if I was going to title it uh, with a clever title, I would probably call it this, do something about it. See, we're very quick to find the problems and to talk about them uh, in every dimension, in our homes and churches and families and in our nation and so on. But what we need to see is that the Lord is saying, then do something about it. 
What was the major thing that you should know if you are able to see failure in leadership? You pray, but what should you discover from that? That you are qualified to lead. If you can see the problems, you know how to lead. And, and Verl brought it to your attention again last night that you're not just talking about pulpit ministry. We're talking about leaders. Well, what is a leader? It's an individual that has someone following them. I don't care what, they, what title they put on you. If no one is following you, you are not a leader. Now, one of the divine um, attributes of womanhood is the power of influence. I may just preach to you. Just, just go back in your thinking to the Garden of Eden. Who influenced who? See? Women have that power of influence, and, and we need to learn why we have it and to use it rightly. A woman can set the tone of a home without ever opening her mouth. We just have a, a way about us that the whole family reads very well. And, and they know whether to tiptoe around us or talk to us. And I think that we need to learn how to use that power of persuasion in right ways. I meet women frequently who say to me, oh, my husband has no interest in church at all. Now, now that is, something is wrong there. Something is wrong because the Bible says that they are sanctified by the believing why. Now, what does that mean, that they're saved and going to heaven? Because you are, no. It means that they are set aside in a protected place. Just because you're a believer, the devil can't kill them. Are you, are you hearing that? Therefore, the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the believing wife. Else were their children unholy, but now are they clean. Now, that, what that's saying, if I may just be so bold as to put it in my language, is you who know Jesus, ladies, have the power of persuasion innately. You can affect girls, and we affect one another. You know, for example, your husband has a comfortable pair of shoes that go out of style. He doesn't care. He likes those shoes because they're comfortable, not us. We will throw away a very comfortable pair, cram our feet into something that aches because everyone expects it. You're sitting at dinner. You never see a man say to another man there at the table, I'm going to the restroom. Would you like to go with me? <laughs> they don't do that. We do that. We do that. We, we, we want to be, we want to be together in everything. We want to influence one another. And even if you don't have to go, you'll go with her, you know, it just. So when we recognize, when we recognize you who are married to unsaved men, don't pick up the guilt that well, you know, if I lived right, he would be a Christian. That's, that's not where this is going. But do pick up the faith that says, you don't have a chance. You are sanctified. You're set aside until such a day as you make the right decision. And then determine to live in his presence the godly wife life. Now, some, some women, when they meet Jesus, they make Jesus the other man in their life. And they're suddenly too spiritual to have sex, too sanctified to laugh at anything funny, too pure to watch the games with him. And he resents that Jesus that you get a certain look on your face when you talk about. 
Jesus, I love you. And he thinks, fine, I used to have that love. Now, when you meet Jesus, you should become a better lover. A better wife, a better housekeeper, a better mother, a better everything. Because Jesus came to better us. See, I dare to do that because I'm an old lady. And this is Mama talking to you. And if you can hear what I'm saying to you, you go home and your men will be glad you came to this conference. <laughs> We started by looking at why the children of Israel were in bondage. It was because they chose other gods, other than the true living God of whom we sang this morning over and over. There's no one like you. There's no one to compare with you. You're the only one. You have complete control and charge of my life. When that is true, things begin to fit into place. How many have learned that? How many have learned it, but you're not going to raise your hand? See, we know some things. We learn as we move along that, that he, he wants us to do his will, listen, so that he may position us for blessing. Everything God requires of you is for you. You're a little slow. It's morning. I understand that. See, everything God requires of us is for us. See, God's not a big eagle maniac sitting up there on a throne saying, praise me or I'll kill you. <laughs> but he is almighty God and he says, if you praise me, you will be open for blessing. If you acknowledge me, you cause me to see a place where I can give to you. If you tithe, you open yourself for financial blessing. And he's so sure of that, he says, prove me. Malachi says, try it. Test me now and see if I will not open the windows of heaven. So we come to a church a meeting, a gathering like this. Some are clams. <laughs> Closed. And they're saying, bless me if you can. <laughs> Others open up the shell like a turtle and move out and say, here I am, Lord. My life is in your hands, whatever you would do. Now, we saw Deborah yesterday, and she became accustomed to the situation while functioning very well under her calling. But God wanted something more than that, and something inspired her. I'm certain it was God. Something got through to her. Do you ever wonder how you can go for years in a certain situation and then suddenly everything God does is suddenly, even if it takes 40 years to happen. When we finally see truth, it is suddenly, it's a way we testify to one another. I say, well, I used to believe thus and so, but you know, suddenly I came to realize. If you could hear the angels up there, their conversation would probably go like this. Suddenly, we've been working on her. <laughs> She's had 8,722 messages on that subject. <laughs> suddenly she got it. See, I love that. Do you love that? Because I, listen, I'm not uncountable on heaven's record till I get it. But you now are divinely ruined. You did get this. You've been getting it all along here and saying, amen, amen. As soon as you say amen, up there on your record, it says, got it. <laughs> so at this time, Deborah realizes it is time for them to extricate themselves from the bondages that are holding them. This has come out in every service in this conference. 
in, in a variety of ways it's been said, shake yourself, uh, throw off the bands, the bonds that, uh, that are yours. We are free. Your children are free. We've sung the songs. It has been a message from the Lord that you are not in bondage. Now, if you think you are, you will function that way. Like the eagle, you've heard the story of I know that was captured and, and chained to a tree in the front yard. And they could not go anywhere, he could not go anywhere, but around and around the tree. One day the man loosed the chain and the eagle continued to walk around the tree. We condition ourselves. And, and God has to come on the scene and say, Awake, Deborah! Get up! Do something. Awake and put on your strength. Awake and, and do something about the situation. Why didn't God call Barak first? That's what uh, society teaches us. First the man has to get it. If the man doesn't get it first, he ain't going to go anywhere. No. God has given such a cleverness to women that we have the capability of bringing new concepts to men and making them think they figured it out. <laughs> you, you know, you just kind of feed it in there when they're open and shut up when they're closed. And that's, that's the beginning of wisdom. Don't hammer it and don't write scripture verses and put it in his lunch pail. Just, just, just love him. And there'll be moments of openness and so on. You can put that in. God gave it to Deborah because Deborah was in a position of authority that she did not misuse. God woke Deborah up and said, you don't have to function in captivity. Let's do something about it. She got the word. Oh, Father, please give them understanding. Girls, if you can hear Mama this morning, it'll save you a lot of hurts. The first time God speaks to you, the tendency is that that means you must carry out what you heard. Deborah, you've been counseling these people for 20 years. And you've had some counsel. All of it's been for me and it's been good. But it's time now for us to wake up and win over the enemy so that you don't have to just repeat the counsel. Some of you that are counselees, you are professional counselees. You come to the same counselor with the same problem, month in and month out and year in and year out. It's time for you to extricate yourself from the thing. Well, I you know, see, it's, it's not something I can free myself of. It's, it's, you know, it's my marriage. Well, then let's affect a change. Well, you mean I get to dump him? Oh, no. God can change him. I challenge you to intercession. I challenge you to faith in seeing him in a different way. Begin to look at him as though he's already committed to the Lord. And some of you are married to Christians who are very content where they are. All you have to do is ask the Lord to muddy the waters. I mean, what moved you on? We sang a song today, thank you that the river came and snatched me away. I think the words were a little different, but the whole thing was. <laughs> that's the way we need to intercede. Get him, God. When my son walked away from the Lord, every time we were together and, and, and something would come up, I'd say, you don't have a chance. And, and he got so he'd say it back to me. He'd say, I know, Mom, I don't have a chance. See, but I really believe that with all my heart. He was raised in a Christian home, in, in, in a godly situation. I knew that he belonged to God. I had taken him as a child and dedicated him to the Lord. That's a covenant thing. And just because he backed out didn't mean I had to. Oh, no. 
And I just claimed that covenant. I said, God, you got a problem. This kid's rough. As soon as he got out from under my control, he went crazy. Get him. And I prayed that for almost four years. Get him. He was a good guy. That was the problem. He wasn't, you know, crazy out there. He was just a good backslider. Now, I, of course, would not tell this story if he hadn't come back to the Lord. <laughs> but when I saw him come back, it, it wasn't even amazing to me. See, that's what God wants. Awake, Deborah. Affect something there. If you got kids away from God and the enemy is saying, oh, you didn't do right, and it's because he saw failures in you, that is good news because the devil is a liar. And anything he accuses you of is a lie. So when he tells you those things, you just need to say, oh, I'm so glad I heard that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I begin to get up. Get off the ash heap. Let the sun hit it. Let it become beautiful to you. Now, what's Deborah going to do? She's going to, going to awaken from the situation and affect a change. Can you imagine this? Deborah goes out and she gets a trumpet and she blows a trumpet and calls all the troops. And she says, I've heard from God. He has spoken to me and, and I will be your commander in chief and we're gonna go out and fight, fight, fight. She didn't do that, but she has the word of the Lord. Are you there? And she says, Lord, this is hypothesis, of course. Lord, I know this is your word, and I know Barak has to hear it. Speak to him while I'm on my way. We use words like prepare them. I never minister to you included or any place else that I don't ask that there be an equal anointing on the hearing as on the mouth. What good would it be? I'd be a Bible wired for sound. That's right. See, I'm interested in you hearing what the Spirit is saying. And by the time she got to Barak, she said, Up! Get up! Haven't you heard from God? Didn't God say something to you? I remember when God... Uh, really moved on Verl that she was to start a church and so on and I was involved in the beginnings of that and, and so on and, and her husband who is a, a big hunk good looking dude and, and and this great big guy was a warden in a prison and and he had a good job and he was highly respected and so on and now Verl is uh, is known as a soloist I'm going somewhere with this because I want you to hear this. I mean, she was an incredible, you, you know that, you saw that. She picks up a microphone, sings Amazing Grace, we all go straight to heaven. <laughs> so she had that heavy anointing. And, and, and she would sing and other people would preach. Now she gets a word from God. <laughs> okay, you've been singing a lot of years, now it's time. All this thing I put in you, I want you to preach and I want you to start a church. So she says to her husband, I've heard from God. He says, go ahead. Well, fine, go ahead. You got my support. Ah, oh, but she was smarter than that. She said, I'm not going without you. And as time would have it, as they began this and the church began to grow, he said, honey, I feel like I'm supposed to take early retirement and get fully involved. And she's going, Pfft. He didn't know how to preach, but he sure does now. <laughs> See, Deborah knew how to go through proper lines of authority in order not to fulfill the word of God, in order to let God fulfill his word. Why did he speak to her first? Because of that power of influence. He knew Deborah could influence. If they took the women out of the church, can you picture a church service? 
All the somber men, good morning. God bless you. It's good to have you here. It is time now to praise the Lord. Let us praise him together. Now, men will always obey. They'll praise. But here's how they would start. Praise you, Lord. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. It would, be, it would be so boring without us. See, all we need is a chance. All we need is an opportunity. You have to, if male or female, we don't care. Whoever's in charge says, it's time to praise the Lord. Yes! See, because women are kindling. That's right, we can get the thing started. It didn't take any time to teach. I have, I have taught praise for 40 years. It, it didn't take any time to teach women how to praise the Lord. You just set a, a kind of a tone. Isn't the Lord good? How many of you know he's wonderful? How many of you have something to be thankful? Look at you. If I was talking to men and I said that, they'd say, yes, he is good. Doesn't everything within you just cry to praise him? Indeed it does, it does. <laughs> now before we get too excited about ourselves, let me remind you that kindling burns out very quickly. And men are logs. They don't start quickly, but they last long. See, if you and your husband are on your way to church together and you have a little spat, I know Christians don't, but they do, <laughs> and everything is, is bad for you, when the two of you walk into church together, you have an attitude, I'm not going to praise because I'm not a hypocrite. See, so we stand there. Right alongside you is this man that argued with you all the way to church. <laughs> Praise you, Lord! Hallelujah! <laughs> See, and your attitude is, you hypocrite! <laughs> you show off! <laughs> but that's not true. Let me tell you about a men's, men's minds. A man's mind is like a pigeonhole desk. They have little placements for everything. They have a place for their job, for their children, for you, for God, for church, for friends, for golf. Everything has a little place. We just have one big space. See your husband in the morning, he says, goodbye, darling. I'll see you at five. I'll look forward to it. Have a great day. He comes back at five and he remembers that. <laughs> how are you, dear? Don, how are you dear to me? <laughs> you had to stay home with those kids all day like you either. You see, that doesn't make any sense to him. He's saying, what did I do wrong? Is this the same woman I left at eight? With this humor, and I love it when I share these things because they're, they're observations I've made over the years, and I love it when I see the young women go, that's right, of course it's right. God didn't make you a female man. And when he puts you in a position of leadership, the most disgusting thing you can disgusting thing you can do is try to be masculine in your leadership. 
God, I'm a man in leader. You're not either. I don't care how you dress or, or look or how tough you talk. He knows your parts. And I don't care if you operate and take someone else's parts to replace them. The psalmist said it. Yes, he did. He said, all my parts are known to you. They are numbered in heaven. So when the time comes to go up, the replacement takes place. That belongs to her and that belongs to him. So Deborah goes to Barak, really honestly believing that God has preceded her going. And she says, hath not God said, she's going to the commander of the army. Has he been adequate? <laughs> 20 years they've done diddly poo. <laughs> but he's still the commander. That'll hit you about two o'clock when you lay down to get a little rest. Oh, yeah! <laughs> and she says, it, it, it is time for you now to be mindful of what God already said to you. It's time for you to do what God is saying. We've got to make a change. And Barak says, and this is so interesting, all right. If you will go with me, I'll go. But I'm not going without you. Now, I, uh, I really could preach an hour on that. Of course, I could preach an hour on the word therefore. <laughs> what is going on here? This is not her husband. This is the commander of the army. And she has, she, the prophetess, has gone to him with a word from God, reminding him, you've already heard from God. And he says, all right, I'll obey, but I'm not going without you. I think it's prophetic of where we are today. Now listen, the church has been all Deborah and then all Barak. I've watched this pendulum swing several times in my 72 years. All women doing everything, prophesying, praying, reaching, and so on. And then all men get the women out. This is, we, and we go through the whole headship and submission of teaching. How many of you have been through that? If you're alive, you've been through it. <laughs> and we missed it. We just didn't get it, that he made them male and male and female are the completion of God. And if you take one apart from the other, you don't have the whole picture of our God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are revealed in His creation. So it isn't, well, bless God, if the men aren't going to do it, we'll take over. You're not in sync either, I see. Green. But... <laughs> I, you know what I just did to you? I'm going to tell you. I just got 20 minutes new attention span by doing that. Yeah. All right. It, it isn't either or... It'll never be successful. The church will never move the nations until it's male and female, Deborah and Barah. Working together, together, together. Coming into harmony. Of course it begins in the home. But listen, those of you that don't have a husband, you're not exempt from this. 
we work through proper authority, and authority has little or nothing to do with success that they prove. Well, I don't see how I can work through my pastor. He just, he isn't in the river. He doesn't, he doesn't get it. He's your pastor. That's it. Period. Well, you know... If my husband was, you know, really walking with God, I would really respect him. He's your husband. Remember those awful words you spoke for better? Or worse? In sickness, in health? That was when you were so enamored, you know so lost in his love. I take thee, and I give me. And now, 25 years later, 35 years later, the Lord reminds you of it. And now you have grown in the Lord, and you have outgrown your husband, perhaps. You know things in God he doesn't know. You see things in the Word that he doesn't get at all. There's no prophetic awareness in him at all. But if you're rightly related to him, if your love is obvious to him, he will listen to the prophetic through you. God is saying for you to go, he says, all right, but I'm not doing this alone. I'll go with you. And Deborah says, fine. But you're going to miss a lot of the glory you would have had if you'd led your men on out and gotten this thing on its feet. See, I was thrilled when Promise Keepers was born because I saw men, 50,000 at a time, reaching out to God. And I thought, oh, at last, we've had our women's conferences and we've grown to the Lord. It's time for our men to grow. And then when that kind of waned a little bit, my heart grieved. And then it dawned on me, oh, well, that wasn't the place it's supposed to be. The whole reason for a conference is not to pump you up to wish your church was different. It's to put something within you that will make your church different when you go home. Awake from captivity. Awake to the awareness of what go into all the world and preach the gospel is. It isn't just evangelizing like we have seen it in the past. It's everywhere you go, let your light shine, that men may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. When you go home and back to your surroundings, it ought to be said of you, wow, I don't know what happened to her. But it's good stuff. She said, you know, God wanted you to take the men and progress without the need for women to light your fire. But I'll go with you. And you, 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 the whole credit will go to a woman. Now, I'm sure that Barack was thinking Deborah was speaking of herself. But she wasn't, was she? She was speaking of little J.L. Little J.L. who, as far as we know, was not even a believer. She was in a neutral Canaanitish country. Um, she was uh, so safe that the enemy ran to her. And something came over her. Something hit her that said, use your sphere of influence the right way. And the enemy came to her tent and she said, come on in, lie down, you're weary. Here, have a little bit of milk. And go see me by. <laughs> bye, oh bye, oh baby. And when he went to sleep, she went over and got the peg of a tent, put it on his temple. What a woman. <laughs> Took a mallet and drove it through his brainless head. 
And then she sat down and waited for Barack's people to show up. And she said, the man you're looking for is in there. He's in a permanent sleep. <laughs> uh, I, I deliberately used humor to take the gore out of that story. But you see, when God gives us a word, listen, he goes before us and any obstacle which we're capable of handling, he leaves. Any obstacle which we're not capable of handling, he removes. You heard that. I, I, I can't remember right now who said it, but it was said this morning that I think the, the worship leader said something about he expects us to do what we can do. Deborah had no idea that, that the enemy would go to jail's tent. She didn't know how God was going to do it, neither do you. How's he going to accomplish it? I don't know. Well, then, do you really think you should stir Barack up to get his 10,000 men to go? And, 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 and by the way, the whole church didn't vote yes. Every tribe was called. Not every tribe responded. Well, you know, I just don't think we should do it if everyone isn't for it. Really? God wanted a majority? God in two? With God in one, you put a thousand to flight. Just add one more. You put 10,000 to flight. And then we have to get a calculator. Can you imagine? And we just get a few people together to say, let's go with God. With God is the key. success. The enemy is destroyed, but it took 10,000 willing men to get out there and destroy the armies all the way. There was only one left for the woman. There was only one man left of any influence that Jael had to get rid of. And God took care of that. God will take care of your situation. Can't you just see us all the way to the tomb? I have the anointing oil to anoint his body. Oh, well, they put a stone over it. Oh. Well, I really felt I was supposed to anoint the dead body of Christ, which is the job of every leader. Uh, Selah. And they're on their way, these women, and they've got, it's early in the morning, they've got the spices, and they're saying to one another, who's going to roll the stone away? I don't know. Well, then why are we going? This is stupid. We know the stone's going to be over the cave of, of the grave, and, uh, the sepulcher, and, and we've got uh, spices here to anoint his body. We can't get in. Why? Dry. That's the voice of the enemy. All the way going there, they had to have a little anxiety because they're women. <laughs> How are we going to do it? I don't know. I just know that we're going to do it. Oh, come on, ladies. Isn't it time for us to start talking that way? How's God going to get your kids? I don't know. How's he going to get your man? I don't know. How's he going to revive your church? I don't know. Well, do you know he? Oh, I've got a word from God, and he's going to do what he said he'd do. I know that I know that I know. And when they got there and saw the angel sitting on the stone, it had been rolled away. I'm sure this went on in their minds. There's a lot of silent things in the Bible, so I try to fill it in. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure what went on in their minds was, oh, if I'd only known an angel would show up. Oh, sure, that makes sense. How many of you know it makes sense when it's there? And he said, what are you doing here? <laughs> well, we came to anoint the dead body. He said, it's already been anointed. <laughs> ah, he says, revival's already hit. He's not here as you suppose. He is risen. 
Don't seek the living among the dead. And don't seek the dead among the living. Don't put churches and groups and people in boxes or coffins and call it dead. You don't know that maybe they've had an angelic visitation and come to life. Oh, that denomination's dead. Oh, I tell you, I know about that. We, oh, yeah, let's see, 82 years ago. We do that with people, too. Oh, yeah, we do. We wrap the grave clothes around people tightly. Say, oh, that's so and so. Yeah, she used to be an alcoholic. Yeah, and that's so uh, indefinite. You know, you wonder how long this cleansing is going to last. And she was in prostitution for years. You know, we inform one another, make people wear their their reputation around their neck instead of saying, "There's a sister." There's a child of God. I hate titles. I don't even like naming denominations. I wish, I wish it was against the law. I wish we had to name churches by color and position. That's the white church on 8th Street. That would be so good for the church, for the people in, of God to not know where they came from. What if you went into church and, and they were serving the Lord like you serve the Lord and you found out they were from that dead denomination? <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying this morning? See, when Lazarus died and Jesus was called to the grave, he, he stood there and looked at everybody, and everybody is content that they have properly buried him. It's true. They did, he did die. And it was four days ago, and hey, God, we gave you a chance. We prayed for you. We invited you to come on that scene long before he died. And, no. You did nothing. And now, he's dead. And Jesus just looked, he didn't even argue with him. Sometimes he just looks at us and says, what's he used to talk? <laughs> and he says, roll the stone away. Now, do you find that interesting or not? I find that very interesting. Why should they roll the stone away? He's there, he could just poof it out. <laughs> I mean, the angels could roll his away, they could certainly roll Lazarus away, he could do anything. And Jesus said, get rid of that stone. Why? Because they had put it there, he hadn't. <laughs> Don't you seal up your loved one. Oh, there, I, you know, I've done everything I ought to do. <laughs> Don't you put the stone over the cave of their dwelling. Roll the stone away, and God will speak to them. When they roll the stone away, Jesus just said, Lazarus, get out here. And can you picture him coming? He's in grave clothes. Yes, master. When he came out, he, Jesus turned to those who had buried him and said, Loose him and let him go. Take those grave clothes off of him. I have spoken life into his being. Revival has come. Awake. Great success. People are set free. Israel is free again. Barak has thanked the tribes who did respond. Deborah writes a song about the whole happening, and that's all in this chapter 5. 
And she says, ah, uh, nothing happened until I, Deborah, verse 7, chapter 5, Until I, Deborah, arose, a mother in Israel. You know what we think a mother in Israel is? Someone who has been around a long time. Well, that's, see, this come on is like sick them to a bulldog. We do that in our church. We say, that's mother so-and-so, and, and that's, that's old mother so-and-so. She's a true mother in Israel. What does that mean? Sometimes I hear pastors tell me, uh, see, that's, that's, that's sister so-and-so. She is so faithful. I say, what does she do? Do? She doesn't do anything. She's just always here. Are you there? See, and just because I'm old doesn't mean I'm a mother. I can be old and crotchety and cranky. Old sit in the pews and have a fine fault with absolutely everything that takes place. God raised you up, mothers and sisters. I'm asking that for him to do in you. Well, what is a mother? What makes the difference? It's a primitive word, the word mother. It is that which is the bond of a family in a wide sense and both literally and figuratively. But, but, but what in the, in the literal sense do we think of when we say it's a mother? Don't tell me you're a mother in Israel unless you can answer yes to these questions. Do you share in the birthing of children? Do we provide for their maturing and growth? Huh? Is that what mothers do? You, you saw the pictures last night before the offering of this mother giving birth under all kinds of negative circumstances. And the child is born. What's the first thing she does? Even knowing she doesn't have enough milk, she puts it to her breast, somehow saying, whatever I do have, I give to you. Oh, you don't have to memorize the whole Bible or go through a Bible school or seminary before you can nurture a new believer. Don't let the enemy ask you, what do you think you have to give? Give what you have. You're hungry, if you're hungry enough, a piece of bread looks good. I grew up in a parsonage and my daddy was my pastor and we were poor, there were five children. Back then in the ministry, in our circles, you kept the, the minister dependent on the Lord. <laughs> and when Thanksgiving would come, instead of having meatloaf, we had meatloaf shaped like a turkey. Oh, many times. My clever mother was able to do that. And she would shape it and take a little cherry and make the little red thing on it. And we would say, wow, happy Thanksgiving. And when we told our friends, you know, our little playmates, they would be jealous. Wow, my mom never does that. Oh, you poor kid, all you had was turkey and dressing and all the making. <laughs> Give what you have. My folks had that capacity. They made our toys. And we used to trade moments of time. You can, we'll trade you for 20 minutes for their store-bought bicycle. And they would take our skateboard thing that dad made out of a box and some skates. And they wanted that. See, it was the attitude that my folks had. You have everything. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. that's right. Oh, please hear this. I'm not just talking about things monetarily yeah. or physically. We have the same attitude with God. Well, if I had her in 
inside. And if I had her depth, and if I could pray like she does, and if I could sing like she does, and if I could, if you could, you'd be them, dum-dum. God isn't trying to make you like anyone but himself. So it's time to look around and say, all right, I, I, I'm a mother in Israel. What do I have that somebody needs? Sometimes it's as small a thing as a smile. I told one of the ladies in the singing group yesterday, I said, you bless me with your smile. She just, she, she has a capacity. She just, when she smiles, I can't help but smile back. You just, you just do. And sometimes it's just, one little thing, just a nod of the head. You're receiving the word as a gift to me. Are you a mother in Israel? Are you bringing birth? Are you providing for maturity? Do you both teach and train? Do you protect them from the enemy while teaching them how to battle? Do we help them adjust to their siblings? Or do we take sides? Do we love them selflessly? Mothers do, you know. I look back. I remember just one incident when I was a little girl and my mother was pregnant for the brother just under me, three years. And she was eating an egg, which was a, a luxury to us. And dad had fixed her an egg and brought it to her in bed. And I was standing by the bed and I must have been drooling and whether I said it, I don't know. I've heard the story told, but whether I remembered or remember the story, but I wanted the egg so badly that she turned the plate to me and let me eat the egg. It was not until I was much older that I learned that my mother was very ill and it was very necessary for the child she was carrying to have that kind of nourishment. And so my father had taken a job in the mill while he pastored in order to buy some eggs and milk to help nourish mother. Are you, are you hearing? But it was my mother's joy <laughs> to give this greedy little kid what she needed and I only wanted. Someone got that. Isn't it interesting that when a spoiled young Christian makes demands on us for something they don't need, they just want it, that we resent it. No, you don't get it. What do I have to give? Love, joy, peace, long suffering, <laughs> gentleness, kindness, meekness, temperance, faith. I see it is my, I, I'll tell you this, I'm quite choleric in temperament, and, and it is my nature that if I say it to you, you get it. <laughs> now, it just is my nature. I don't. And when you come back and you haven't got it, uh -huh. That's I really don't like you a lot. <laughs> I don't want to repeat. You can see that. I don't preach with repetition. I just say it. If you don't get it, come on, wake up. But through the years, I've learned not everybody gleans from the first spoonful. They take a little bit in their mouth and the rest, like my grandsons, it drips down the side. And you think you have fed them the full meal. 
and all they got was a little taste. More peas. And about the 18th time they come back and want the same old thing. More peas. Here's how they ask. I just don't understand. And they go through the same thing that you went through. And I mean, the first time you went through it was with absolute patience, love, and gentleness and understanding. Here, let me help you see. And we prove it by the scripture. Here, here's what the word says. And then we, we think we're praying into their spirit. Dear Lord, we just now, we just seal this truth. Oh, don't feel guilty. I get all my illustrations from myself. And, and I, I have found out through the years that when I thought I was sealing truth, I was sealing graves. And my attitude was, I've told them, I've said it, I've made it clear, I've given them time I didn't have, and I'm not going through this again. <laughs> and the Lord says, roll the stone away. You are going through it again. I'll make a mother out of you. <laughs> oh, until you are more concerned with the growth and the protection of your children, spiritual children. See, instead of finding fault with young people who come to the Lord and then walk away, and come to the Lord and walk away, and instead of finding fault with them, we ought to nuzzle up to them and say, here, I've got faith in that area, hang on to me. And lastly, I've given you seven questions and I'm gonna wrap this. I'm repeating right now. Do we share in birthing children? Do we provide for their maturing? Do we both teach and train? Do we protect them from the enemy while we are teaching them how to battle him? Do we help them adjust to their siblings? Well, you know, I've been, I've tried to get along with the people. I've gone to that class in my age group and nobody speaks to me. I don't even know my name. I've been going for seven weeks. And when I look at them, they just look at me like, Ugh. you hear that report. Why do you think you're hearing it? They need help. They're wanting, they don't know how to break the ice. If you join them in their, in their frustration, you're not helping them. But if you say, hey, give them a sentence. So well, next time you're in there, just say to someone, I've been noticing you for seven weeks. I don't even know your name. Forgive me. Mine's Iverna. They need mothers. They don't know how. I've, had, I've told the simplest thing to people, and they say, oh, yeah, that'll work. Other people say, I don't want to, our church is so large and, and I don't want to go to someone and say, you know, I don't know you because they could have been coming a long time. I said, well, what's the harm in that? You're going to offend them by saying, hi, are you new here? No, I've been coming here seven years. Really? Will you forgive me for not knowing you? That's what a mother does. Mother doesn't get embarrassed. My mother used to go through all five names when she was dealing with us. <laughs> Johnson, Robert, Tom, Jim, Iverna! My hair okay? See, and she, she, she never was embarrassed about it. It was just, hey, one of you little brush. And, and, and that's the attitude that we ought to have now. Here it is. Deborah can answer yes to all seven questions. She has been counseling for 20 years. She has given herself selflessly. And now she has obeyed the word of the Lord. It is time to move up higher. If you don't learn this, my dear, then the Lord cannot answer our prayer to save souls because you've got all you can handle. 
He couldn't have given her any more people to counsel. Huh? Are you there? She's got all she can handle. So what he has to do is say, let's move to another level of freedom, another step of maturity. That's why I've been challenging you. And I'm, I, I want you to hear me. I'm through. You who have not had spiritual mothers or mothers in the natural, but you who have not been nurtured and cared for and loved selflessly, get off your pity party and become what you never had. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for mothers in Zion. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, I, Burnham, that as you partook of El Shaddai and fed on him and nursed from him, that you would be able to feed us. And our breasts are full. Believe me, this has been so great, I tell you. I just wish I could put her in my pocket and take her with me and pull her out. And, and when I have a question or a problem, say, hey, Dr. Tompkins, what, what about this? Put her back, bring her out and say, what, what you need today? I, I tell you, but you know, she can't be in your church. You can't take her. She's a busy lady. You can't get Dottie and put her in your pocket and pull her out. Verl and, and Lila and Diane and, and Shirley Arnold. We can't do it. But you're here and God is raising you up to become that mother. I'm telling you, there was a time in my life that I, I thought, God, I can't do what you want me to do. I loved people one-on-one. -on -one, I think I was a good pastor's wife and counseling loving but God, just whatever he asks you to do, just have a willing heart. It's so beautiful. And I love the part about when she talked about authority. And you know, Lapidoff was Deborah's husband. Didn't say a thing about her having children. But his name means to shine forth. And you know, Unless we get under that spiritual authority, as unto the Lord, even because we know we don't live with perfect men, even though my husband's a, a godly man, he's the pastor of this church, he has his flaws. I do too. But I choose to come under that spiritual authority and do what's right unto God, honoring him in all things. And it works, ladies. Because Lapidoff is the type of Jesus that will shine forth and he will give light to your circumstances, to your walk, and it makes it easy and it won't be dark and confusing if we'll get under our cover and then obey God. When Awake Deborah, the whole concept of that came in my sunroom and I was studying Judges and the Lord spoke to me and he said, Deborah and Barak must be one and work together. That's in our homes with our husband. That's what he wants to see because Deborah was submitted. And not only that, the intercessors working with the pastors, being under submission. If you work in a church as a leader, come under submission to that pastor. He might not be as great as you want him to be, but if you would pray for him, 
God can change him. And don't get into witchcraft and pray. And prayer is the wrong way to manipulate God trying to get him to change your pastor. Let's do what's right and honor God. It's really neat when we do. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for the message today. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for the women, the mothers in Zion that you've raised up. But Lord, we know one day that we won't always have them to lean on. Oh, we can take their videos and tapes and say, oh, listen to this one. But God, you're asking this generation to come along and to nurse from you so that we can nurse others. Lord, I pray that you will equip these women today, that you will, God, go so deep with this message, all the messages, and just line upon line, precept upon precept, that you would build an army of women, mothers, leaving this place, Lord, full of your glory and your light. I ask for a special anointing when they leave this place that they will not a one. I'm asking you, Lord, not one will be like they came in, but they will be changed. We ask it in Jesus' name. We love you, Lord. Amen. All right. Let's take a 10-minute break, ladies, when Diane Sloan's coming back. You don't want to miss this either. <laughs>